All right, Emily Higby. <clears throat> so Emily Higby, I'm one of our star staff here at Redwood Energy. She is our director of research. Um, she's going to be presenting today on our almost published commercial retrofit booklet that we interviewed Stet earlier um, you know, because they had just a fountain of knowledge here about cold climates. So Emily has led research in domestic hot water use and modeling, resilient home design for extreme weather events published with the Rocky Mountain Institute, facilitates Redwood Energy's ongoing zero emissions construction guide series. And so she's been the lead now on, on five booklets. Um, with me, but you know, really, she's doing the lion's share of the work. Um, Emily is also the project manager of Red Red Energy's CEC funded EPIC grant on central heat pump water heater load flexibility and manages our staff researcher projects that cover a wide range of topics on building electrification. So, incredibly knowledgeable human being, um, a consummate professional. Welcome, Emily. Oh, but you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, can you see my slides? You don't see like the presenter mode or anything? Correct. You can see just your okay. slides. Good. All right. So like Sean said, this is this presentation is going to cover kind of like a teaser for our newest booklet. Um, and the purpose of this guide, like all of our other guides, is to show that electrification is possible while also touching, you know, a broad, broad range of topics, HVAC, domestic hot water, electric cooking. Um, showing the different strategies <clears throat> in general, and then also showing like detailed product lists and um, case studies as well. So next slide here. Um, yeah, so also like Sean said, this is a continuation of our series and you can go to our website and download these for free. Um, we have guides on single family, multifamily, commercial, our latest was on single family retrofits. And then also we, um, one that's released recently was multifamily and cold climates that we did with Consumers Energy. So you can go to our website and download those. And uh, so why are we here today? Um, we all know that building electrification um, is essential to meeting the world's climate goals um, and commercial buildings contribute to 16% of carbon emissions and 10% of natural gas consumption in the United States. So they're definitely a piece of the pie after, after residential buildings and also industry, but um, also very important. <clears throat> and this is kind of looking at California specifically, commercial buildings um, are pre predominantly heated with furnaces and heat pumps and 14% uh, do not have heating. And it's just kind of interesting looking at the different IOU territories where San Diego area has the most heat pumps already, about 52%. And then PG&E has the most furnaces, uh, gas furnaces, about 53%. And, you know, it's likely in San Diego that they were kind of early adopters of heat pumps because of the milder climate. But now heat pumps could be, you know, applied to each of the territories. And, um, yeah, next slide. So part of this guide uh, was for us to learn a little bit more about commercial buildings and doing so we interviewed um, some industry professionals. And this is just a, a sample of some of the quotes that we got just like in on commercial electrification, electrification in general. Um, the general trend is that um, it's possible to retrofit commercial buildings um, even for the harder retrofits. Um, Ted Tiffany says, almost all of our gut retrofits are able to go all electric for major renovations. We're able to guide the client to go all electric um, by providing technical solutions that have a similar life cycle savings as the gas equivalent. And we can make these arguments pretty well. John Goutry says that higher end developers and universities are absolutely 100% on board with electrification. No question about it at all. And uh, Brandon Gill says that, you know, three to four years ago, 10% of their projects were all electric. And now about 90% of them are. This is mostly driven by ordinances in the Bay Area. However, um, owners are also pushing for all electric now. And that's great. Um, that's great to see. And so this is kind of a breakdown of what the heating equipment looks like in commercial buildings. A lot of it, or majority of it is single zone. Um, and that looks like packaged units on uh, packaged units, 
So single zone type of gene answer about 59%. And then they also have similar uh, split system version of that, about 13% uh, buildings. And these are numbers for in California. And then you also have like zonal uh, HVAC, like unit ventilators and package terminal units are also very common. And then multi-zone systems uh, that are, you know, for larger buildings uh, contribute about 6% of buildings in California. And that would be just larger packaged multi-zone systems. Um, and then air to wa water delivery systems like large chillers and boilers. And then more common uh, recently are variable refrigerant flow systems that can serve multiple zones, basically like a mini split, but for larger buildings. <clears throat> and now talking kind of a little bit about each of these categories, um, packaged rooftop units, um, you know, because there's so many uh, buildings that have these units, it represents a really big market. And so that Stanbor Stanborn says that uh, it's the biggest market if you want to make a move on actually getting gas out of commercial buildings. Um, it's to target rooftop package units with easy retrofits. And they're relatively a one-for-one -one replacement. Um, you might have to like upsize the capacity um, in colder climates to meet that heating load, but um, generally it's like a one-to-one -one -one replacement and pretty straightforward. And uh, here's some case studies looking at um, retrofits uh, of packaged units. Um, this is Berkeley Mental Health Services. Uh, the retrofit was led by Integral. Um, so it's a zero net energy retrofit of a 1925 historical building. There were minimal ch shell changes because it was a historical building. Uh, they kept some of the historical windows and they retrofitted to two Daikin Rebel heat pump package units with 100% outdoor air and um, with heat recovery and electric resistance backup. And kind of one of the more innovative parts of this design was that they used uh, thermofusers in some of the zones, which allowed for less VAV boxes and uh, for smaller zones. <clears throat> and, um, you know, being able, being in a more mild climate, like in the Bay Area, they're able to utilize more outdoor air. So that, you know, also allowed them uh, to use less VAV boxes than what's typical. Okay, and then another retrofit with a similar strategy was Sonoma Clean Power's headquarters. And they also used uh, Daikin rooftop units with variable air volume delivery and thermofusers at the zone level. Uh, this building is 15,000 square feet. Um, it's two stories and was retrofitted down to the studs with all new insulation, all new windows, all new siding, um, new mechanical system. and um, they also have battery and solar as well. And part of this project, one of the challenges was they had to do an electrical service upgrade. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about uh, variable air volume with reheat retrofits. So this is kind of like less common overall in commercial buildings, but buildings at scale this is a very common way to heat the building. Um, you have uh, VAV boxes that uh, deliver air to the space and uh, reheat is supplied with either water coils or electric resistance coils. Um, electric resistance was common, but kind of fell out of favor because gas became less expensive and uh, you know designers were trying to avoid peak usage with electric resistance. But now it's interesting, the industry is kind of moving back to electric resistance because <clears throat> now we're seeing that there are a lot of losses when using gas boilers. Um, kind of like preliminary studies have shown that um, because you know, you're wasting a lot of heat by running pipes around the building to just reheat at the zone, it kind of makes sense to rightly size the electric resistance coil and you know, it could end up using less energy that way. So those are the two like main strategies of reheat. And we're particularly interested in this because gas boilers um, are typical uh, for this reheat. And um, that can introduce a pretty challenging retrofit 
because they're designed for 180 degree water. And uh, yeah, to kind of talk about the solutions to this, uh, we're gonna talk about some case studies. So case study or solutions with air source heat pumps. Um, this was from conversations with Taylor Engineering. They did a recent retrofit of two buildings, two sister buildings in the Bay Area. They both had existing chillers and boilers for reheat. One retrofitted to a heat recovery four pipe heat pump. And then one kept their original chillers and went to a heating only heat pump. So one of them, you know, got rid of the chillers and, you know, had a heat pump that did both providing both heating and cooling, but one was more cost effective to keep the chillers there and then just went with a heating only heat pump. And uh, so since, you know, most buildings are designed for 180 degree water, they, um, they typically do a test. They turn down the boilers to 120 degrees Fahrenheit just to see if the building has enough heat. And they, they did this test um, during a typical morning and uh, both buildings passed. So after that test, you know, they knew they could do uh, heat pumps instead of boilers. And, um, you know, the owners were somewhat hesitant or the part of the design team to just rely on heat pumps. Like they potentially wanted backup boilers, um, but they, based on the tests that they did, they didn't necessarily have to have them, but there was, uh, they did analysis and there was enough power on site to add one in later if the owner wanted to do that. So um, yeah, and um, Taylor Engineering was saying that in the several uh, boiler retrofits that they've done, they've been successfully able to turn down the loop temperature to like lower 120, 130 degrees. And this is a, a quote from Reinhard Seidel at Taylor Engineering. Um, he said, in most cases, typical heat pumps that can produce 120 degree water will actually work just fine in buildings with an existing boiler reheat system, as long as they have two row coils, which most buildings do. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, part of my conversations with them, they're saying that if potentially you needed more capacity, it's possible to kind of uh, retrofit the VAV box. So instead of having, you know, two rows of coils, you could introduce more rows of coils if needed. And it would be a somewhat, uh, you know, not difficult, but it would be a, you know, a process to do that, but it's definitely possible um, because you need, you know, more heat delivered to each space at a lower temperature, more surface area. But in most of the buildings that they've come across, they haven't had to do that. And um, they're able to put in air source heat pumps um, to retrofit the boilers. And then another example <clears throat> that's similar using air source heat pumps is uh, Diablo Valley College and Integral uh, led the design of this or is leading the design. And this is a community college that's expanding their campus. So they're connecting new buildings as well as electrifying their central plant. And they, they found that um, coils are generally oversized and um, you know, they, they got them to work doing a similar test uh, to, at lower temperatures without many modifications to them. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they're typically, and they said it's typically oversized because designers before, you know, uh, you know, a few years ago when the buildings were built, uh, didn't necessarily assume that there would be as many internal loads. So because there are so many internal loads that um, you know, most of the coils are oversized and over over engineered in that sense. So you can actually put lower temperatures through them. And um, so John Gautry inter Integral said that the DVC retrofit has a common central plant with a heat pump that can produce heating of, on its own, or it can recover waste heat from the chilled water to generate hot water. Uh, and um, he also said that pushing the chilled water temperature up and the hot water temperature down makes the plant exceedingly efficient and you can get COPs up to seven. And I will note that um, using heat recovery heat pumps are generally common when you have buildings with high 
heating and cooling loads happening at the same time. So you can recover that heat from the cooling side and um, use it for the heating side. And this makes sense at you know, a larger campus, um, but maybe not as applicable to a typical you know, office or um, yeah, just a smaller commercial building. And uh, I wanted to mention this strategy as well from Taylor Engineering. Engineering. And this is more applicable to large buildings. So, you know, we talked about heat recovery. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, if there isn't cooling and heating happening at the same time, then you can store water uh, to use later. And so their, their strategy, they call tier, and they wrote an ASHRAE article about it. And I kind of, I linked to that in the bottom of the slides, if you want to read more about it but it's essentially um, a cascading system to get up to higher temperatures for you know, really large commercial buildings. Um, so maybe not necessarily your typical, but pretty large buildings. Um, so first they use air source heat pumps to warm up the water to about 80, 80 degrees and they store it. And then from there, they use water source heat pumps to heat the temperatures up to around 130 and then deliver to the building. And this is kind of just like a simplified explanation and schematic. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, you can read more in their article. And uh, Brandon Gill says that in new construction, it makes a whole lot of sense to use water, water to water uh, heat pumps and couple them with storage. So you can reduce the amount of air source devices you need, which are more expensive and less efficient. And they also take up a lot more space. So, um, this creates a more cost-effective design. So yeah, one of the main benefits of this design strategy um, is that you can use less air source heat pumps, which can take up a lot of space. And um, yeah, store, store water for when you need it. And uh, this is also uh, an interesting presentation that Redwood Energy hosted with Transom. And they also have a like cascading system, uh, theoretical system that they presented on. Uh, so you would use air to water heat pumps, combine them with water to water heat pumps to get temperatures hot enough for radiators. And um, you can you know, learn more about that on our YouTube channel. We have a link to that presentation, but a, a similar concept. Um, for slightly higher temperatures, 180 degree water. And then this is more like a teaser as well. Uh, we're gonna have a product guide in our document and there's you know, gonna be more detailed specs and um, of these different kinds of products. So heat recovery chillers, um, just air source heat pumps, two pipe and four pipe. Um, so. You can look forward to that in the full version of our document. Um, so the next kind of equipment type or variable refrigerant flow. <clears throat> and uh, it seems like there's a lot of, you know, high performance buildings using VRF systems. And, uh, you know, uh, it's generally like, they are really efficient and they can be sa space saving for retrofits, but, um, their leakage is unknown and, um, you know, there's actually kind of a movement after, you know, learning more about commercial buildings and talking to these professionals, there's more of a movement towards going with classic variable air volume with the heat pump reheat instead of using VRF because it's kind of unknown how much they're leaking. You have to run refrigerant lines all around the building and, um, you know, there's various, various trade-offs between the different technologies. Um, but this example, this case study here, uses VRF um, heating and cooling. And it, they also pair it with HRVs by Ventacity. So using the ERVs, they were able to reduce their heating and cooling capacity requirements by about 50%. And um, yeah, it was a very um, efficient system. And then this is another um, case study the Sitka Public Library in Alaska. And you know, it's a very cold climate. So this could be a potential, you know, good application for VRF because they do go down to low temperatures. 
And um, this building originally had a fuel oil boiler and um, switched to VRF heating. So that's a, that's a cool case study. And now moving on to you know, heat pump water heaters. So this is kind of like a, an industry trend to come up with skids. So it's kind of like an all-in-one system that you can purchase from these various manufacturers. And um, you know, they're more oriented towards retrofits, but definitely could be used for um, new construction as well. Uh, yeah, they're kind of nice. They have you know, the storage, the heat pumps, the pumps, whatever you need, all built into one. Uh, so it's easier to install. And uh, a few of the brands, uh, Small Planet Supply, using the, the Sandin system. <clears throat> Uh, the Origin system uses, I believe, the Mitsubishi um, heat pump water heater. And then also Colmac, Nile, and um, Link also have similar, similar systems. And uh, some case studies regarding heat pump water heaters. This was a you know, large office building, I believe, in Canada, um, Arthur Erickis, Erickson Place. Um, they retrofitted their boiler to the uh, Sandin heat pump water heater system. And this was led by Small Planet Supply. And this was kind of like their intro. Um, now they're going to supply uh, more of the skid systems. But this is one of the projects that they did working up, working up to that. So that's cool. And then also Colmac, uh, Colmac, Colmac has lots of heat pump water heater case studies from you know, all over the US. Um, a lot in Hawaii. Um, yeah, just showing that heat pump water heaters can be used in commercial buildings of all types. And uh, the last topic, um, electric cooking as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, mention another video that we have on our YouTube channel uh, by Andres. Saldivar um, by Tokel Edison. He has a really good presentation on just electric cooking in commercial buildings. Um, <clears throat> and just a few notable products, electric deck, deck ovens, um, you know, they have more precise control, stackable, um, just a really cool product. Um, rapid cook ovens and combi ovens. These are like add-ons that you can do to commercial spaces that there's um, no ventilation required or little ven ventilation required, which is nice, which is a benefit of um, electric equipment. And uh, uh, yeah, Andre, I have a quote from him. All electric kitchens are preferred by many for various reasons. They're more efficient. Um, they make a cooler kitchen. Um, there's no hood required for some equipment. They're faster, safer, flexible. They can be plug and play. And um, upfront costs is less for a lot of products. Less parts, easier to clean, um, take up less space and less ventilation. And then this is just a slide I got from Sean. Uh, like a lot of, you know, high end, uh, high end chefs promote all electric kitchens. Um, here's a few few of them, creating their you know ideal kitchens with uh, all all electric bases. Um, and these are three Michelin star, star chefs. Um, okay. And then lastly, a uh, case study I wanted to mention, uh, Stanford University, one of, their, um, one of their kitchens on campus, they electrified it. Um, and they uh, have an electric, an electric flyer, uh, fryer, um, two electric griddles, and uh, with convection ovens in an induction ra range. And, EHDD led this design and um, yeah, this just provides diverse meal plan for students all around the world at Stanford University. And uh, I guess, yeah, just quickly, um, heat pump pools also possible in uh, all sorts of climates. Uh, this is in New York. And then also there's another one in Hawaii, Olympic sized pools using, using heat pumps. And uh, yeah, thank you. And do we have any any questions? <laughs> well done, Emily. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, let's see here. Oh, one new message 
Okay, so Diane says, awesome overview, Emily. <laughs> awesome overview, Emily. This info is super helpful. And, and I have to admit, like it's not everyone lives in a commercial building. Everyone lives in a house or apartment. So sometimes yeah. this can be a little more obscure, but um, let's see here. I think that there's Eric Morrill is asking a question about the prescriptive path. Does the prescriptive path, uh, this is an energy modeling, allow for using mm -hmm. electric resistance coils or do all those need to be modeled for the performance compliance path? Uh, good question. I know the performance modeling software does not like electric resistance. Um, so, um, and that that was actually brought up in like in a few of my the interviews that we did that you know electric resistance can be a good method um, at the zone, but it uh it just kind of like blows up the software. <laughs> so um yeah, I'm not sure you you know you might have to get a certain exception or just meet better performance in other aspects of your building. Um, I don't know the exact details of that, but I know it's it's hard to get electric resistance to pass. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Bailey was asking us to speak to the issue of noise complaints from pool heat pumps. Can you speak to options that keep it quiet? Um, I, I might take that one. I'm going to do a lot of research on the pool heat pumps. Mm -hmm. So getting an inverter on any heat pump is the trick. An inverter is a computer. So it's just a computer that controls essentially the inversion of AC electricity, DC electricity, which is what the pumps internal to the heat pump use and running, a, a, having the computer control the DC electricity to speed up, slow it down, dramatically quiets it. Like going essentially usually five decibels to 10 decibels, which in their experience is half as loud to one fourth as loud. So uh, when my brother put in a heat pump for his swimming pool in, on Long Island, New York, you can be standing next to it and it can be just powerfully pumping. And all you can just sort of hear is the movement of air. Like it really is almost no mechanical sound. Um, that's an aquacal, ultra quiet heat wave, such and so. But basically getting inverters into heat pumps, both for HVAC and domestic hot water and for swimming pools, all of these things, stick a little computer in there. Um, and these computers are very inexpensive, but it just, you know, unless it's in COVID era, that's the trick. Is, is get inverter controlled um, products. Let's see, um, Jack Mason says, most smaller commercial buildings use combined HVAC rooftop units with gas heating. Is anyone exploring replacing, sorry, the, is, there point, is anyone exploring replacing the gas heating units with electric coils? So um, I think that's the PTAC, uh, the packaged rooftop units. Yeah, I think, uh, I haven't heard anything about that specifically. I think it makes more sense to retrofit with the heat pump. And um, if you were gonna do purely electric resistance, I think that would require more power potentially. And so, you know, might be harder to retrofit doing just purely electric resistance. And considering that the performance, you know, approach, modeling approach, and getting buildings to comply with California code doesn't like electric resistance. I think you know it makes a lot more sense to go with a, a heat pump. Yeah, they they're, they've been phasing out electric resistance from spacing and water heating. Um, very, I mean, it's a real effort, and so it's becoming almost impossible to put in electric resistance, no matter what. Not completely impossible, but pretty darn close. Um, let's see here. I think, well, I. Kathy Nicholson speaks for many of us saying, thank you, Emily, fantastic. You did so much to demystify commercial electrification for me. Excellent. Okay, um, if that's okay, then I'm gonna switch over to Louie and, and you can take on comments um, in the chat. All right, sounds good. Thanks okay. everyone.